the action at Rourke's Drift, fought on the night of January the 22nd, 1879, holds an enduring place in the annals of warfare. On both sides, brave men fought to the last. Courage and valour are the hallmarks of a small incident which has become the symbol of heroism and duty in the face of overwhelming odds. Ironically, in different ways, the odds could be said to have been stacked against victory by either side. In the end, the issue lay in the balance, and only brave men's blood could decide the outcome. This is the story of Walk's Drift. In the history of warfare, the Zulu War of 1879 ranks neither as one of the longest or the bloodiest. In many respects, it was a small and unimportant affair fought out in an obscure corner of the empire by men who, in truth, need not have fought at all. The driving force behind the war was Sir Henry Bartle Freya, the British governor of the Cape. He feared that the continued independence of the Zulu nation would prove a threat to British expansion in the region. Bartle Freya, therefore, set out to goad the proud Zulu nation into a position where their only option was to fight. He knew full well that in such a war there could only be one winner. Despite the expressed wishes of the Foreign Office, he issued a series of increasingly humiliating demands. By doing so, he first intimidated, then angered the Zulus to the point where war was inevitable. The situation reached a peak in January 1879 with the delivery of Freya's final ultimatum to Tetswayo, the Zulu chief. Tetswayo was a proud man who saw himself as a peaceful neighbor to the British. He could not begin to understand the hostility which he and his people faced. Henry Freya knew full well that the hot-headed young Zulu warriors could be relied upon to give him the war he sought. The king's frustration was later summed up by one of his warriors who recalled Tetswayo's address to his army. Our king addressed us saying, I have not gone overseas to look for the white men. Yet they have come into my country, and I would not be surprised if they took away our wives and cattle and crops and land. What shall I do? I have nothing against white men, and I cannot tell why they come to me. They want to take me. What shall I do? Give the matter to us, we replied. We will go and eat all the white men and finish them off. They are not going to take you while we are here. They must take us first. So, in December 1878, on the banks of the Tugila River, the British delegation gave notice to Tetswayo that he was to disband his army forthwith. It was an impossible ultimatum. Nonetheless, the British insisted it had to be obeyed by Friday, the 10th of January, 1879. Tetswayo did not submit. Freya had his way, war was declared, and the British invasion of Zululand was underway. In the 1870s, Southern Africa was a very problematic part of the world for the British Empire. Uh, the British had two colonies there, the Cape Colony and Natal, and they'd had all sorts of problems with 
the various Boer republics inland and various African groups scattered between them. Now, in the 1870s, they adopted a new forward policy, which was attempting to sort out something of this political mess and to pave the way for future economic expansion in the region. And they sent out a new proconsul, Sir Henry Edward Bartle Frere, who was sent out specifically with the intention of implementing a new policy called Confederation. And the whole idea behind Confederation was to bring these various groups under British control, whether they wanted to or not. Now Frere, very soon after arriving in Southern Africa, decided that um, one of the quickest ways to bring this about was to force a war on the Zulu Kingdom. The Zulu Kingdom was probably the largest independent black group left in Southern Africa, and it maintained the largest army. And Frere took one look at this and decided that it would be very good to break the power of the Zulus, to draw them within the kind of economic framework that he was trying to develop. And also it would be useful to demonstrate a little British muscle militarily in Southern Africa to make sure that everybody else towed the line. And Frere began something of a propaganda war, if you like, um, to prepare both Southern Africa and the British government at home uh, for the onset of a campaign to break the Zulu power. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world, from the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era right through to the Second World War. If you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Despite the fact that London would send him no further reinforcements to precipitate a war the British government did not want, Henry Freya's Zulu War had, in fact, been long planned and anticipated. The last regular troops to reach him were the 2nd Battalion of the 24th, 2nd Warwickshire Regiment. The 1st Battalion of the 24th had been at the Cape since 1874. Both battalions together were to play a major role in these historic events. The arrival of the 2nd Battalion 24th brought the British regular army in the Cape up to 5,400 men. They were reinforced by various native troops and some volunteer formations, making some 10,000 in total. Lord Chelmsford, the British commander, organised his army into five columns. Three columns were to enter Zululand at three different points, while two would remain behind to guard against Zulu incursions. Lord Chelmsford himself would accompany the third column, making straight to Ulundi, the Zulu capital. With this fateful decision, he would enter the pages of history. By today's standards, the British Army of 1879 needed comparatively little logistical backup. Nonetheless, the task of feeding and supplying 15,000 men for a campaign of up to six months' duration required a massive effort. Some 30,000 oxen were requisitioned to move supplies and ammunition. Most of the British supplies were transported in the huge Cape wagons. 18 feet long and nearly 30 hundredweight unladen, these wagons needed up to 20 oxen to pull them. Because of this, it was necessary for the troops to establish supply camps on route. Often, these supply bases also doubled as hospital posts. One such post was at Rourke's Drift. The British had major practical problems when campaigning in Southern Africa in the 1870s. Uh, they had to cart all their supplies with them. There was very little in the way of an organised commissariat department to back them up. They had to hire a lot of civilian transport. Uh, an infantry battalion required something like 17 wagons to keep it in the field for any length of time. They had to carry all their equipment with them, all of their food, even fodder for the horses and mules, that kind of thing. So throughout the Zulu War in particular, it was necessary for the British to establish a chain of supply going up to the front and on into Zululand. And the reason why Lord Chelmsford chose Rourke's Drift as the kick-off point for 
the uh, invasion of his centre column was simply that there were two useful buildings there which he could use to stockpile supplies and stores and there was a very handy road across the Mzinyati River into Zululand at that point. So here was an ideal supply depot where he could stockpile all his supplies ready for the kickoff into Zululand and onto the invasion towards Ulundi and beyond. On the 9th of January, Lord Chelmsford and Lieutenant Colonel Glidden with the third column approached the Buffalo River, which formed the border with Zululand. They pitched camp at the small settlement near the river known as Walks Drift. It was considered a useful spot. Today, Walks Drift is very much unchanged. It is now a peaceful monument of great deeds, but the buildings have been modernised since the battle. In 1879, the settlement at the drift consisted of two small stone buildings with thatched roofs and beside them a kraal. This was the property of a Swedish missionary named Otto Witt. Having sent his family to safety, Witt, who spoke Zulu, had stayed behind to act as an interpreter. He did this in the hope that his small action might prevent the needless shedding of blood. As a man of God, he knew and respected the Zulus. But in his hope for a peaceful accommodation, he was to be disappointed. Rourke's Drift was selected as an ideal position for a supply base. In due course, a small military post was established by Assistant Commissariat Officer Walter Dunn, along with James Dalton and storekeeper Louis Byrne. Witt had used one of the two buildings at Rourke's Drift as his home, the other as a church and school. The church now became a storeroom to supply the post. It was stacked with boxes of biscuits and sacks of corn. With the arrival of Surgeon James Reynolds, Witt's home was itself converted. This time into a hospital to serve the needs of Lieutenant Colonel Glynn's column as they moved into Zululand. By January the 12th, only two days after the expiring of the ultimatum, there had been a few skirmishes with the Zulus. By the second day of the campaign proper, there were already badly wounded men to take care of. The journalist and adventurer Duncan Moody later collected the accounts of many of those present at Rourke's Drift during the engagement. One soldier later described the transformation of Witt's home to a hospital. <coughs> the dwelling house was over 80 feet in length. The side wall on the left, running back, nearly 60 feet. It had been fitted up by the medical authorities as a base hospital for the column. And nearly all rooms, as well as the large veranda in front, were occupied by patients, 36 in number, including some who had already been wounded at a taking of Cyril's Kraals on January the 12th. The large storehouse was occupied by the Commissariat Department and was full of provisions of all kinds. On the 11th of January, the time limit on the Governor's ultimatum had run out and the main body of the column moved on from Rourke's Drift into Zululand. Tetsweil was now at war with the might of the British Empire, and they intended to carry the war to him. In the 1870s, the Zulu army was the most powerful and sophisticated independent black force left in southern Africa. There were fundamental differences with the European army. Uh, it was primarily a national service army, if you like. It was a citizen army. Um, all the men of the Zulu kingdom were required to put in a period of service for the Zulu king, and they were organised along the, uh, the grounds of their common age. The king would call up regiments, called Amabuto, every few years of all the young men who'd attained a certain age since the last call up. And then they would be placed into various regimental barracks called Amakanda around the country. And they would be required to serve the king in a number of ways. They were the local police force, for example. They took part in his hunts. They took part in the great national ceremonies. But also, of course, they were his military machine. Um, they were very highly trained. Uh, they had a somewhat conservative military 
ethic, they were still primarily armed with shields and stabbing spears, as they had been since the creation of the Zulu Kingdom in the 1820s under King Shaka. But they were very aggressive, they were very highly motivated, and certainly the British realised that uh, there was an awful lot to admire in the Zulu army, and that was actually one of the reasons why Sir Henry Bartle Frere was keen to break the power of the Zulus in the first place. With the departure of the column for the interior of Zululand, a detachment of about 300 men of the Natal native contingent remained behind at the drift. Other than the red bands which marked them apart from the Zulus, they were armed and equipped identically. However, their will to fight was considerably less than their fearsome adversary. This dubious force came under the command of one Captain William Stevenson. Also present were the 80 men of B Company of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, who took up guard duty under Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead. By the river, Lieutenant John Chard, a subaltern in the Royal Engineers, was working with a small detachment to maintain the pont bridge, which had been used to make the crossing. Rourke's Drift was under the overall command of Major Spaulding, the Chief Supply Officer. With the main column gone, there was little of note to report. On the 22nd of January, after an uneventful ten days, Spaulding decided to ride back to help Makar to see why promised reinforcements had not arrived. Before leaving, he handed over command to Lieutenant Chard with what must possibly rank as the most misguided intelligence briefing in military history. I see you are senior, so you will be in charge Although, of course, nothing will happen, and I shall be back again this evening. His advice was to prove spectacularly wrong. Major Spaulding had not been gone for more than a few hours when two riders brought news from the third column's camp at Isandlawana. In one of the greatest reverses suffered by the British army in the entire Victorian era, the camp at Isandlawana had been attacked and overrun. 1,300 British troops and their African allies were killed. Worse still, a fresh Zulu army was heading towards Rourke's Drift, intent on dealing the same hard lesson to the small band of defenders at the former mission station. DCF Moody recorded the shock of the arrival of the newsbearers. Other mounted men arrived from the late camp and told of the horrors they'd escaped and the uh, dangers that were about to overwhelm us. Uh, doubtless the poor fellows had seen terrors enough for one day and were possessed by an earnest desire to warn the people in help Makar in time. And so, like so many before and several after, on they galloped to carry out their laudable intention. Lieutenant Bromhead at once struck his camp and sent down for Lieutenant Chard who was engaged with some uh, half-dozen men at the points on the river to come up and direct the preparations for defence. Lieutenant Chard consulted both Bromhead and Commissary Dalton, who was an ex-quartermaster sergeant. Dalton's advice was particularly sound. He urged Chard to stay and fight rather than try to outrun the oncoming enemy. He argued that they would stand no chance in the open. He also suggested using the stores as part of the defences. Against the advice of Dalton, an attempt was made to at least remove the most badly injured patients in the hospital to safety. But even as wagons were brought up to take them away, the Zulus were sighted. There was to be no escape. The wagons which were to carry the wounded were now added to the barricades hurriedly being built between the hospital and storehouse. Quickly, and effectively, the defence was erected. Even though it was hastily constructed from stacks of meal biscuit boxes and overturned wagons, the barricade was to prove its deadly efficiency later in the day. Of course, as soon as the garrison at Rourke's Drift heard that they were about to be attacked by the Zulus, their immediate reaction, naturally enough, was that they were stuck in this awful position uh, with no preparations for defence whatsoever. Uh, I think it was Henry Hook who said we were trapped like rats in a hole. Um, but in fact, when you look at it, uh, with the cold uh, 
sort of anal analytical mind of hindsight, as it were, it's actually not a bad defensive position, given the sort of attack that it could expect from the Zulus. Uh, there were the two buildings, they had thatched roofs, which was a major disadvantage, of course, but they were only about 30 yards apart. Um, in front of them, there was a, a patch of flat, flat ground, which dropped away in a rocky ledge about four foot high. Now, some of the barricades were built on the top of that ledge, which actually made a barricade about seven feet high, which is quite a formidable obstacle for anybody attacking it. The buildings themselves, particularly at the back, um, had very little in the way of doors and windows. Uh, the garrison were able to knock loopholes through so that effectively they were firing from behind um, solid walls with just little gaps to fire through. And uh, all in all, there wasn't an awful lot of room for the Zulus to manoeuvre. Um, there was some ground in front which had um, trees and other bush in it, which was a bit awkward for the defenders. But in fact, there was a bit of a killing zone generally all around the buildings within sort of 30 or 40 yards in most cases. So on the whole, given that uh, the Zulus would have to get close to be able to use their spears and shields to good advantage, the defenders actually had decidedly the advantage. With all hope of escape gone, the wounded and sick what? men were taken back to their places inside and the patients brought in from the veranda. It was a move that would save some lives, but at a cost. Although it was not good, the situation did not yet look desperate for Chard and his men. They were, after all, some 300 men to defend the perimeter. But as final preparations were made, there was a new and desperate turn of events. Work on the barricade had been proceeding apace, and the men of the 24th laboured alongside the native troops of the NNC. As soon as news arrived that the Zulus were on their way, the native troops of the Natal contingent bolted from their post, leaving their regular comrades to their fate. It is described here with typically clinical detachment in the contemporary record of field operations kept by the British Intelligence Service. Soon after 4pm, firing was heard to the south, and the enemy were reported to be close at hand, upon which the detachment of the native contingent who were within the post quitted it with their officer. The garrison was now reduced to the company of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, about 80 strong, and some men of other corps, the total number within the post being 139, of whom 35 were sick in hospital. By attacking even the lightly held mission station, the Zulu regiments who attacked Rourke's Drift were ignoring the only really valuable piece of tactical advice their king had given them. He advised them not to attack the British in defended positions. Ignoring this advice was to prove a grave error. The matter is in your hands, he told us, but if you come near to the white man and find that he has made trenches and built forts, that are full of loopholes, do not attack him, for it will be of no use. But if you can see him out in the open, then you can attack him, because you will be able to eat him up. The Zulu regiments that went on to attack Rourke's Drift had actually been held in reserve earlier that day at Tisant Luana. Uh, there were four Zulu regiments, the Utuluana, the Ndlondlo, the Udloko, and the Ndlu Yengwe. They were pretty much senior men. They'd been held in reserve partly through accident, but possibly partly because they were uh, more elderly men. Most of them were in their late 40s. Most of them were married. They played a very minor part in the Battle of Isantlwana. Uh, they'd been used to mop up some of the fugitives. They'd moved on that day before the start of the fight at Rourke's Drift, probably about 15 miles or so across country. They'd swung wide of Isandlwana Mountain, crossed the Umzinyati River, and then gone on to attack Rourke's Drift. Most of that they'd probably covered at a, a pretty fast jog, if not actively a run. So most of them were probably beginning to feel the effects of that by the time they arrived at Rourke's Drift. But on the other hand, they were buoyed up because they'd missed out on the glory at Isandlwana, and they were keen to get a bit of the action before the day was over. There were probably round about 4,000 of them, at a rough estimate, and certainly with their enthusiasm, with their discipline, um, they would be more than a match, I think, for any British soldiers that they caught in the open that day. Of course, the one thing that they weren't um, able to deal with 
uh, was British firepower, particularly when the British were behind a secure barricade, because of course the Zulus did need to get close with their spears and their shields to inflict any casualties, and all the time that the British could keep them at a distance and shoot at them, the Zulus would be at a serious disadvantage. Instead of having 300 men to defend the perimeter, Lieutenant Chard now had only the 80 men of the 24th. But they were 80 men who, by their courage and valour, would write their names in history. As the Zulu regiment rushed up to the small fort, the men of the 24th kept up a military fire which checked the initial rush of the Zulus against the south wall of the barricade. Lieutenant Chard later recalled the opening moments of the fight. About 4.30 p.m., 500 or 600 of the enemy came in sight around the hill to our south and advanced at a run against the south wall. They were met by a well-sustained fire, but notwithstanding their heavy loss, continued to advance to within 50 yards of the wall, where they met with such heavy fire from the wall and crossfire from the store that they were checked. The greater number, however, without stopping, moved to the left around the hospital and made a rush at our northwest wall of mealy bags. After a short but desperate struggle, they were driven back with heavy fire into the bush. The main body of the enemy were close behind and had lined the ledge of rock and caves overlooking us about 400 yards to our south from where they kept up a, a constant fire. While the men on the south wall were protected from the Zulu fire from the hill above them, those on the north wall had their backs exposed to the fire of Zulu riflemen firing from the hill to the rear. The scarlet tunics of the 24th made a perfect target, and soon casualties began to mount, even in the face of the less than expert Zulu marksmen. It's one of the great myths of the Battle of Rorke's Drift that the Zulus who fought there had looted large numbers of Martini Henrys from the camp at San Luana earlier that day. Of course, in fact, they'd actually been the reserve at San Luana and they hadn't had time to take part in the looting before they went on to attack Rourke's Drift. Most of them, nonetheless, would have had access to some kind of firearm. There had been an illicit gun trade into Zululand over the previous 20 or 30 years. But they were antiquated firearms. They were generally obsolete European patterns, even old brown best muskets. Now, when the Zulus took up their positions on the Oscarberg or Shiani terraces overlooking the post at Rourke's Drift, they were in a very good position to fire right down into Chard's defensive line. But in fact, they were firing at ranges of three or 400 yards, and most of them were using weapons that were really only accurate at about 100 yards, or had only been accurate at about 100 yards 20 or 30 years earlier when they were new. So they're now old weapons, rusty weapons, inadequate powder, poor quality ammunition. So the Zulus are firing away at a distance, really, that was um, too great for the sort of guns that they had. And in fact, they put a terrific volume of fire down into the post, but it was largely luck if anything hit anybody there. Although it's nonetheless interesting to note that, that most of Chard's casualties were still hit by um, gunfire at some stage during the battle. <laughs> As the Zulu forces encroached on the barricades of Rourke's Drift, the fighting grew fiercer and casualties mounted. Once again, the survivor recorded the desperate events of the day. A whisper passes round amongst the men. Poor old King Cole is killed. He was at the front wall. A bullet passed through his head and struck the next man on the bridge of the nose. Mr. Dalton, who was a tall man, was continually going along the barricades, cheering the men, using his own rifle most effectively. A Zulu ran up near the barricade. Mr. Dalton called out, Pop that fellow! And aimed over the parapet at another. When his rifle dropped, he turned round quite pale and said that he'd been shot. Well, the doctor was by his side at once, found that the bullet had passed through above the right shoulder. Well, unable to hold his rifle any longer, although he didn't cease to direct the fire of the men who were near him, he handed it to Mr Byrne and used it well. Presently, Corporal Scammell, who was near Mr Byrne, was shot through the shoulder and back. <laughs> 
Well, he crawled a short distance and handed the remainder of his cartridges to Lieutenant Chard and then expressed a desire for a drink of water. Byrne fetched it for him and whilst giving him to drink, poor Byrne was shot through the head. Fell dead instantly. If the casualties among the regulars were mounting fast, they were nothing compared to the appalling losses suffered by the Zulu warrior. When the sun came up on the morning of the 23rd of January, the British were appalled at the sight that greeted them. Rorkstrift had been turned into something of a slaughterhouse. There were great heaps of Zulu bodies piled up against the barricades, particularly in front of the hospital, which had been charged over time and time again. Now, Chard says that in the immediate aftermath of the fight, they buried something like 350 bodies in front of the post. But he admitted later that quite a few more turned up over the subsequent weeks and months. And in fact, there are some quite reliable statistics which suggest that something like 600 Zulus were actually killed at the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Now, on top of that, of course, you've got a, an unknown number of wounded. Even if there were only three or 400 wounded on the top, which would be a very small proportion, you're looking at something like 1,000 men who sustained a wound in action. Well, we said earlier that there were only about 4,000 Zulus who took part in the fight. So it means that something like one in four Zulus who took part in the fight sustained some sort of injury. And there are some very graphic accounts, actually, which suggest that even men who survived sustained two, three, or even four wounds and then were helped away by their comrades and somehow survived. So that the price that they paid in these tenacious attacks was really quite remarkable. It was a, a very costly and bloody battle as far as the Zulus were concerned. Despite the terrible bloodshed, the intensity of the fighting continued to rise. At dusk, then evening passed, the struggle deepened. The most desperate fighting at this point went on in the hospital. In a maze of tiny, cramped rooms divided by thin walls and doors of little substance, the patients had been trapped. The Zulus burst in here first of all, and several defenders were immediately killed. It became necessary to retreat into the interior rooms, defending each single connecting door, one at a time. All this time, the enemy had been attempting to force the hospital, and shortly after set fire to its roof. The garrison of the hospital defended it room by room, bringing out all the sick who could be moved before they retired. Privates John Williams, Henry Hook, Robert Jones and William Jones, 24th Regiment, were the last men to leave, holding the doorway with their bayonet, their own ammunition being expended. Because of the interior communications and the burning of the house, it was impossible to save all. With most heartfelt sorrow, I regret we could not save these poor fellows from their terrible fate. Privates Hook, Jones and the others had been forced to hack away through the inner partitions of the hospital in an attempt to reach the safety of the inner enclosure. In hand-to-hand -hand fighting, one man would hold the enemy at bay at the door or hole he had come through, while others passed more badly injured patients through into the room beyond. This frantic action was repeated over and over as the hospital burned around them. This heroic action must rank as one of the greatest feats of courage seen in the whole Victorian age. Private Hook certainly deserved his Victoria Cross rather more than the unfavourable image which Hollywood was to paint of him. Private Alfred Henry Hook, Harry as he liked to be known to his friends, uh, is one, the one figure in the Rourke's Drift saga who's been rather maligned in the popular imagination. Uh, he was, of course, a main character in that very excellent 1964 film Zulu, which in many ways had quite a lot that was good to show about the Battle of Rourke's Drift, but did alter some of the characters. Now, Hook is it in, in it is shown as being a, um, something of a drunken malingerer and an insubordinate barrack room lawyer, somebody calls him at one point. Uh, in fact, he was a perfectly respectable soldier. He was a small landowner before he joined the army, uh, he was a family man. He was a lifelong teetotaler, apparently. Um, so he wasn't at all the way he was portrayed in the movie. He was one of those who was deputed by Child or Bromhead to defend the hospital during the battle. And we actually know quite a lot about his role because he, he wrote a very long and eloquent account, one of the best written accounts of Rourke's Drift by a participant, in which he talks about the terrifying ordeal that he went through in the hospital there. The Zulus, of course, attacked the hospital at the height of the battle, broke in through the front, and Hook and a number of uh, other able-bodied men were forced to 
evacuate a lot of the patients by knocking holes through the walls and passing the patients through from one room to another until they finally got out, with of course the Zulus hard on their heels. And at some point the Zulus then set fire to the roof as well, so Hook actually says, well, we then had a fine choice of either being burnt alive or being massacred by the Zulus. So Hook really is one of the great characters who emerges from the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Uh, he subsequently earned himself the VC, and I think really that um, nobody could doubt that he certainly earned it on that day. In the darkness of the African night, lit only by the flames of the burning hospital, the fight for Rourke's Drift grew ever more desperate. A defender later described to DCF Moody the last moments of the hospital defence. When we'd retired to the retrenchment and the hospital had been set on fire, a terrible struggle awaited the brave fellows who were defending it from within. Private uh, Joseph Williams fired from a small window at the far end of the hospital. Next morning, 14 warriors were found dead beneath, besides others along the line of fire. And when their ammunition was expended, he and his companions kept the door with their bayonets. But an entrance was subsequently forced, and he, poor fellow, was seized by the hands. Dragged out, killed before their eyes. Darkness was now complete. Surrounded and having repulsed several charges, Chard ordered his men to retreat first to the middle, then to the inner walls of the car. Here the British were out of range of Zulu fire from the rock terraces above. The burning hospital created both an advantage and disadvantage in the darkness. On one side, it exposed the Zulus who charged the defences. On the other, in ten shadow it cast, we see several determined attempts to break through. Each attack was heralded by the famous Zulu war cry. Despite the ferocity of the fighting, the Zulu warriors did not necessarily win the respect of their peers, as can be seen from this description of the battle at Rourke's Drift, known to the Zulus as Kwajim, meaning Jim's place after the trader Jim Rourke. Two regiments who were too late to fight at Isandwala, Yultana and Ndoko attacked Jim's place at night. But the soldiers fought bravely and the Zulu never got in to kill them. They fought, they yelled, they shouted, it dies at the end. It dies in the doorway. They stabbed the sacks, the dog where they asked the guy. They were struck, they died. It was no longer fighting. They were now exchanging salutations merely. The Utuadna regiment was finished up against. People laughed at them, saying, you are no men, you are just women. Send the to run away, no reason at all, like the wind. Despite the losses, the Zulu warriors, with incredible courage, continued to press home the attack. As his meager force was gradually pushed back into a smaller and smaller area, Chard ordered a sanctuary to be constructed in the centre of the jack. This was for the badly wounded to shelter him. Although exposing himself to fire in doing so, Assistant Commissary Dunn dragged enough mealy bags together for the purpose. A few riflemen were also placed in this vantage point. The remaining British troops were now concentrated in one spot, and they were now able to focus the power of their weapons on a single front. Despite the vicious power of the rifles, the Zulus continued to charge under covering fire from the rock shelves above. Wave upon wave broke upon the defenders throughout the long night, but the British fended off each attack. The battle at Rourke's Drift continued for quite a long time after dark. It was fairly unusual actually for the Zulus to fight after dark and it says something of their desperation and tenacity that they carried on the assaults after dark. Now by that stage of course Chard and his men had been forced back to the small area in front of the storehouse as the night wore on under the terrible 
psychic and emotional stresses of combat, the men were getting desperate for water, getting desperately thirsty. There was a water cart within the perimeter, but it had unfortunately been abandoned near the hospital when everybody fell back to the storehouse. So at some point during the night, it was necessary for the men to mount a bayonet charge out into the darkness to run over and grab hold of this water cart and drag it back near to the barricade so that the men could run a hose through and fill their water bottles and slake their thirst. Now you have to think about that moment for a minute because here they are in darkness, just lit by the guttering flames from the burning hospital. And out there are thousands of Zulus who they can hear chanting and shouting commands and all the rest of it. And somebody actually has to go out into that darkness with just a, a rifle and a bayonet to grab hold of the cart and drag it back. And I think it stretches the imagination extraordinarily to think what a, what a feat, what an endurance that must have been. By the first grey light of dawn, the spirit seems to have left the Zulu warriors. Crippled by their terrible losses, the warriors began to creep away. The morning revealed a scene of devastation. The hospital had been gutted by the fire. Its smoke still dirtied the rising mist. And everywhere lay the dead. Among the dead were the few redcoats who had died near the perimeter. Fifteen of Chard's men were killed, but the overwhelming majority of the dead were Zulus. Fascinated by the scene, Chard walked among the hundreds of corpses littered with empty ammunition packets and cartridges and noted the strange attitudes men had fallen in. Strangest of all, he noted, was that a number of Zulus had died in the same position, crouched forward on their knees and with their faces on the ground. Rourke's Drift highlights, if you like, the difference between the two fighting styles of the British soldier and the Zulu soldier. Uh, the Zulus, of course, repeatedly charged right up to the barricades. But the Zulus, in order to be successful, and they were a very successful army in the past, needed to get close to their enemy. They had to be able to use their shields to ward off enemy blows and to batter the enemy off guard, and then get in with the famous underarm stab of the stabbing spear. Now, the British, in order to be effective, needed to merely keep their enemy at more than arm's length and create a, a successful fire zone which they could fire into at random. Now the barricade at Rockstrift kept the Zulus away so that they couldn't really close with their stabbing spears and the British merely were able to fire into them over the barricades and slaughter them over and over again. The bodies piled up very quickly in front of the barricades. It's interesting that once or twice the Zulus did overrun the barricades and at those points um, bayonet fighting, bayonets against assegais broke out I think it was Private Hitch who said that the Zulus on the whole took no notice whatsoever of the bullets. They just kept coming and coming and we kept shooting them down. The only time they flinched at all was when the bayonet was used freely. Now, of course, it's, it's a totally different sort of psychological type of warfare. Possibly in many ways the Zulus understood the bayonet more, so that's why they were a little bit more respectful of it. But ultimately it was British firepower which created so much devastation amongst the Zulu ranks, simply because the Zulus couldn't get close enough to, to do anything themselves. Although he could not have known it at that point, Lieutenant Chard and his small garrison had won their heroic struggle for survival. What they needed now was the arrival of a relief column and fast. Chard kept his men busy. Although most were exhausted, he was careful to occupy them with routine tasks during the tense wait. One patrol was sent out to gather the Zulu weapons. They discovered many wounded Zulus were still alive. Today, it would be a war crime. But in 1879, unremarked by anyone, the Redcoats simply shot dead the wounded Zulus upon discovery. A tragic end for a brave foe. But the Zulu war was fought under harsh rules and neither side gave nor expected mercy. The silent red corpses lying a few miles away at Esandilwana bore witness to the other side of that brutal law. Shortly afterwards, another disturbing development caused Chad to hurriedly call in his patrols. The Zulu warriors had returned. About 7 a.m., a large body of Zulus appeared on the hills to the southwest. Chad and his men watched with mounting apprehension as they approached around the slope of the Shiyan mountain, kept out of rifle range 
and squatted down on a hill opposite. Then, after some time, they rose as one and went away. The popular belief that the Zulu were saluting the Redcoats is unlikely to be true. There are far more likely reasons for their behavior. The film Zulu includes a marvellous stirring moment at the end when the Zulus reappear over the skyline and start chanting songs and uh, the British garrison work out that the Zulus are actually saluting them for their courage. And it's become very much part of the sort of popular myth of the Battle of Rook's Drift. Uh, I'm sorry to have to say in many ways that actually it didn't happen like that at all. Um, the closest that happened was that on the morning of the 23rd, some of the Zulus, probably the rear guard because most of the rest of the Zulus had already retired overnight, came into view out of rifle range from the garrison at Rourke's Drift and they sat down on the hill opposite and for a few moments the two sides stared at each other before the Zulus rose up and retired back out of view. In fact what was happening they were probably intending to retire down towards the Mzinyati River at Rourke's Drift but they could see Lord Chelmsford's column coming in the opposite direction so they couldn't retire by that route and they simply marched off in another direction. Now it is true that both sides gained a terrific respect for each other's fighting qualities at Rourke's Drift but the practicalities of it were that on the morning of the 23rd everybody was far too exhausted, far too spent emotionally and physically to go in for those sort of niceties. The Zulus who fought at Rourke's Drift had been marching and fighting for 24 hours. They had crossed more than 15 miles of rugged terrain, mostly at the run. And they had been beaten once already by superior firepower of an enemy who showed no signs of weakening. They had seen a quarter of their number either wounded or killed. Most importantly of all, the Zulus could see from their position on the hill that redcoat reinforcements were approaching Rourke's Drift from the direction of Isandlwana. Rourke's Drift was saved. The Zulu war would rage on after the morning of the 23rd of January, but the epic defence of Rourke's Drift was over. The Redcoats were naturally elated, but a terrible blow had been dealt to the Zulu nation. The 22nd of January 1879 was a very costly day for the Zulu Kingdom. The Zulus had fought not only at Isantluana and Rourke's Drift, but also at Inyazana down on the coast. At the end of the day, they had probably the best part of 2,000 casualties. Uh, it was an appalling casualty rate. Um, King Pachuayo is supposed to have said an assegai has been thrust into the belly of the nation. Uh, certainly there were many Zulus at the end of the day who weren't quite sure whether they'd won a victory or lost a defeat because there were so many dead and wounded at the end of the day. And worse than that, of course, it provoked the British into being far more tenacious than they might otherwise have been. By simple virtue of the fact that the Zulus won at Isandlwana, um, there was very little chance of King Pechwayo negotiating any future political settlement because the British were then determined to crush the Zulus militarily before they instituted any and peace negotiations. So not only was it a costly day in itself, it had the most apocalyptic uh, consequences for the kingdom because it led ultimately to the renewed invasion by the British and the great disasters at Kambula, at Ginginjlobo and ultimately at Ulundi, where thousands more Zulus were killed. The great royal centres of, uh, uh, of the king's authority, the Amakanda, were all destroyed and King Pachuayo himself was chased off of his throne and out into the bush and finally captured by the British and brought home as a prisoner. In the face of the disaster at Isandlwana, the British public needed a victory. Here was a heroic feat of arms worthy of the name. The details of the battle were already being noted and the nature of the conflict was elevated by its thrilling odds and acts of bravery from an insignificant siege to a famous victory. When the news of Rourke's Drift reached England, uh, it was greeted with some sort of public euphoria. Uh, of course, it came hard on the heels of the disaster at Isantluana, but it showed up the British Army in a particularly good light. Um, on the one hand, in the morning, uh, an entire column had been massacred. But the point about B Company of the 2nd 24th was that it wasn't some um, specialist Victorian equivalent of the SAS. Uh, it was just an ordinary standard British Army unit. It happened to be the one there on the day. And it proved in the minds of the British public that Tommy Atkins could still stand his ground, that the thin red line had held firm. And when members of the 24th eventually found their way back to Britain, um, many of them were cheered through the streets by adoring crowds. Uh, Lieutenant Chard was presented with a ceremonial sword by the citizens of Plymouth. 
both Chard and Bromhead were invited to Queen Victoria, they were very much heroes of the hour and certainly it helped to offset the series of disasters that had otherwise happened throughout the course of the Zulu War. The men themselves were as eager as any to piece together exactly what had happened to them and why. Some of the things they learned were no surprise. This historic photograph shows the actual survivors of the Battle at Rourke's Drift. Absent is Major Spaulding, their erstwhile commanding officer. Major Spaulding had turned back to help Macar with his reinforcements, believing that the camp at Rourke's Drift had already been overrun. All the evidence would appear to support that view, and it was readily accepted as one of the many errors made in war. Doubts about his word were voiced publicly only by Lord Chelmsford himself. But for most, the important details were of those individual human acts of bravery. In his own account, Duncan Moody is unable to resist singling out individuals for praise. Whilst all behave so gallantly, it is hardly possible to notice other exceptional instances. Although all their comrades bore testimony to such in the conduct of Colour Sergeant Bourne, 2nd 24th, Sergeant Windridge, 2nd 24th, and Privates McMahon and Roy, 1st 24th. Eleven Victoria Crosses were justly awarded for the tremendous heroism shown by the defenders of Rourke's Drift. The most for a single action in the history of the British Army. With that typical brand of pride and patriotism which marked the Victorian era, the broadsheets were quick to commemorate the events of Rourke's Drift. Poetry was a favourite method of commemoration. Moody himself could not resist the temptation. Now, 24th, remember what tis on us depends, and comes to him an answer, a cheer the air that rends. And then, in bitter earnest, each man stands to his post, as in the dark, like devils stark, rush on the Zulu host. And in our history's pages shall the same tale be told, and on the country's roll call the names shall be enrolled of that brave band of heroes who in her darkest hour and when her need was sorest upheld old England's power. Despite the awkwardness of the verse, such sentiments were no doubt from the heart. But it is in the report of Lieutenant Chard to his commanding officer that the most fitting words of praise can be found. I consider the enemy who attacked us to have numbered about 3,000. We killed about 350. Of the steadiness and gallant behaviour of the whole garrison, I cannot speak too highly. I wish especially to bring to your notice the conduct of Lieutenant Bromhead, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, and the splendid behaviour of his Company B. Of Sergeant Reynolds, in his constant attention to the wounded under fire where they fell. Acting Commissariat Officer Dalton, to whose energies much of our defences were due, and who was severely wounded whilst gallantly assisting in the defence. Of Assistant Commissary Dunn, Acting Storekeeper Byrne, who was killed, Colour Sergeant Bourne, Sergeant Williams, who was wounded dangerously, Sergeant Windridge, Corporal Scheiss, Privates R. Jones and H. Hook. The following return shows the number present of Rourke's Drift, 22nd of January, 1879. Twelve wounded, of whom two have since died, viz. Sergeant Williams and Private Beckett, making a total kill of 17. I have the honour to be, sir, your obedient servant, R. M. Chard, Lieutenant, Royal Engineers, Rourke's Drift, 3rd of February, 1879.
When the army returned, the king said, And when will the rest come before me? There were not many of the great regiments present, because many had been killed, and many others were engaged removing their fathers or other relations who had been wounded. Our way of reckoning whether many have been killed of any regiment is by the number of men of importance who were killed. Many chiefs and sons of chiefs were killed at Indiwana. The king asked, and where is so and so? And so and so, they were dead. The dead were not to be counted. There were so many. The whole Zulu nation was weeping and mourning. Oh, <laughs> my